Good morning. Good morning. This is off. Um, okay. All right. This is really hard. <laughs> this is hard to be a preacher. <laughs> yeah. um, I just uh, am very privileged and honored to be able to be here as the personal ministries leader in this church. <clears throat> it's a new office for me. And um, so I this is really um, thankful that I can be here and share it with you this morning. So this morning, as I look around, I see you all look very nice. You're, you're dressed nice. You're dressed ready for church. You're probably, um, you probably have your food all prepared and, and your home clean and everything ready for Sabbath. And here you are this morning in God's temple, right? You're here in God's temple this morning. This is God's temple where we meet together and worship Him. And we want to do our very best um, to present ourselves in a, the proper way because we're here worshiping God in His temple. <clears throat> um, so that's going to be kind of um, how I'm setting kind of my theme, okay? But first, before I say any more, I'd like to just bow our heads for a quick little prayer. Dear Lord, I ask your presence to be here with us this morning, and especially may help me to say the right words that I need to say to get the message across that you would like us to hear. Thank you for our angels. Thank you for your love, and thank you for your promises, and thank you for our church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. To start off with, I'd like to share with you a little history of personal ministries in our church. The handbook, and there's a whole handbook, there's a lot, a lot of information on personal ministries, but the handbook says, personal ministries is a facet of the church whose beginning can be traced to a women's group established in 1869 in South Lancaster, Massachusetts, called the Vigilant Missionary Society. This led to the Tract and Missionary Societies in various New England states in 1870. This society was involved in distributing Adventist tracts, <coughs> pamphlets, books, etc., and helping the needy. Still, many changes followed, and by 1918, what was by then known as the Home Missionary Branch of the Publishing Departments became known as the Home Missionary Department. At that time, the General Conference President, A.G. Daniels, said this department is to train men and women all over the world to go about their homes to win souls to Christ. As time went by, five areas of departmental evangelistic activities developed. The Bible Correspondence Course Enrollments, some of you old-time Adventists will remember some of these things, Community Services, Remember Dorcas Society, it used to be called Dorcas, and the uh, Dorcas Welfare Societies. In-gathering, we don't really actively in-gather, at least we haven't here. Um, lay Bible evangelism and literature distribution. In the years to follow, there were additional changes and mergers, which included the Sabbath school classes, lay activities, the youth departments, and families. Most recently, it stated that some world divisions felt that personal ministries better described the work of the department than lay activities and began using this title for the department. How many of you remember lay activities? Yeah, and it got to be kind of a little joke. Um, and began using, not, I mean, just the light joke, you know, about going home and doing my lay activities, which meant, you know, going home to take a nap. Taking a hike, <laughs> Taking a hike to um, Box Springs. But anyways, um, they began using this title for the department, and the title Personal Ministries was officially adopted back in 1995. When I assumed the role of Personal Ministries leader last year, I really wasn't aware of just how active our church is. We may be small in size, but we're a very, very busy church, just in case you haven't noticed. Lynn Wainscott has the food pantry and the clothing distribution program for the homeless and needy. 
Donald Mack, our head deacon, is responsible for the upkeep of our church buildings, keeping the property and the buildings looking clean and presentable, and for the sign out front. Linda and Tom Riker um, have recently established the Prison Ministries Outreach, which is wonderful. And Marilyn Dove has the investment program, don't forget your dimes, the dime jar is in the foyer on the table, and she'll tell you more about that at another time. Janet Pickering is in charge of our wonderful library, right back there next to the organ, and readily available to each and every one of you, so check it out. Diana Fiddler has the China Mission program. Bob and Linda Durkos are our very own actual missionaries to Mongolia. And Alida Leonor Slentz, she leads out in the children's Sabbath school class every week. She publishes the newsletter called Speaking of Health, which appears in our, um, our bulletin once a month. And she always includes a delicious vegan recipe. She creates and keeps updated the bright and cheery bulletin board in the foyer as you're going towards the fellowship hall it's on the right hand side and it's always bright it's just a really you do a really nice job Alita and she conducts the vegan cooking classes such a busy lady she works very very hard Every, they all work hard the people I've mentioned above they all work very hard, and I know that they are very dedicated to their particular ministry. And we are blessed to have them in our church family, working so hard to witness for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and His soon coming. Eventually, I'm looking forward um, to exposing you all to more of each one's um, particular area of ministry. But today I'm going to focus on the vegan cooking classes. And I also would like to thank the children for your song that you sang this morning. That was perfect. You did a good job. Before I begin my interview with Alita, I would like to have you turn with me back to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I'm going to read this text aloud, and I'm going to add my own name within the text. And I would like you to do the same with me, okay? Are you ready? Ready? Yeah. Okay. Do you, Patty, not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you, Patty, were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hmm. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, really. Just like this is God's temple that we come to every Sabbath, prepare to worship God. My body is the same. Something to think about. And if I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to live in my body, then I need to be very careful about what I put into my body. And we here in the United States have become very unhealthy. The foods that we eat, the lack of exercise, the chemicals we're inundated with have resulted in increased deaths, illnesses, and diseases, many of which are preventable. The top three leading causes of death in the United States are heart disease, cancer, and chronic lower respiratory diseases such as COPD, emphysema, and asthma. I did um, some research, and I had to condense everything, like two, two sentences. Um, but I found that the Mayo Clinic, the American Cancer Society, and the World Health Organization, they all agree that an unhealthy diet, lack of exercise, and being overweight are all common, reversible factors identified in each of these diseases. There are certainly plenty of other familiar contributing factors as well, but these are the common ones and the preventable ones, the reversible ones. Exercise. Ooh, the E word. 
We don't do enough of it, that's for sure, and I am guilty, guilty. I used to go to the gym and power walk at least three times a week, and I quit going to the gym when I got sick with cancer, and I've gotten lazy. But walking? I do walk now, but not the power walk so much, not like I once did. I walk on the beach and the water as often as I can, but obviously it isn't enough. Shame on me, especially after having cancer. As far as diet goes, this is a very broad topic and very personal. We all have our likes and dislikes as far as food is concerned, don't we? But if we are serious about our health, and not only for a healthy lifestyle, but especially for inviting the Holy Spirit into our bodies, then it becomes more than simply what I like, what I don't like. But cheer up, we don't need to struggle with this. When we pray inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives, then we can expect that the Holy Spirit will guide us and help us make the necessary changes. And just like our friend over here said this morning, you know what, he will. Oftentimes, we don't even realize that it's happening. Now, to help us get started in thinking about our diet and healthy living, I'm going to share with you another text in the Bible from way back in creation, at the creation of our world, God's very own instructions for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden on what he created for them to eat. It's found in Genesis 1:29. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth, and every tree which has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. How does that sound? Simple? Difficult? Maybe boring? So let's hear what Alida has to say. Come on up, Alida. questions for um, Alina. Okay? Now, we'd like to hear a little about your background in vegan cooking, like what spurred your interest, your training, that sort of thing. Can you share that with us? Yes. Well, uh, I was living in Puerto Rico, and when I moved here to New Semina Beach, my I mean, I was there, my husband was here, so I decided to come back home, and when I find out that I was home and all the clothes, my clothes that I left there, none of them fit me. And I said, wow, I gained weight, but a lot. I mean, I gained a lot of weight, and I felt very uncomfortable because I was not working, just looking at myself over there. So I decided that I was going to do a cleansing on my body. So I started reading and looking for information and checking everything, and I found something that I can do to, to, uh, to clean my body and it was kind of scary but I did it for 12 days. No eating but just drinking something that was really maintaining me healthy. Did you understand what I'm saying? Yes. 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 Good. Can you, it's in English. <laughs> can you share what it was? The lemonade diet? No. no. I can share with you later. Okay. And I was taking that liquid for 12 days, and I could keep going, but my husband was, no, don't keep going, don't keep going. But that was just to cleanse my body. That was not to lose weight at the moment, to cleanse my body. When I finished, then I decided to find out what to eat. What is that I want to now put in my body that is already clean? And before I used to be vegetarian, but then I said, no, I wanted to be vegan. Being vegetarian, but then left being vegetarian, I was eating everything else, and they said, no, I'm going to be vegan, and I'm going to be staying there and vegan. So that's how I started getting vegan. In my house, I have a lot of books, and I was just reading and reading and reading and reading, and I said, yes, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. 
Okay, so um, what are the benefits? Okay, what training have you had? Okay, um, when I was there back in Puerto Rico too, in Florida, in Orlando, they were giving every year a, a class from the conference that was held, uh, that was called the Health Summit. And I was traveling every year just to the class over there for about a whole week. And the cost was about three or four hundred dollars, but it was worth it because I want to learn more about cooking because that's my passion, cooking. And I was just, I learned a lot over there. I have my certificate from there, and they have a lot of different classes, but I decided to take it in cooking. And uh, when they gave me the certificate, then I had to send it to the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists with a lot of the information that they asked for. And then they certify you to be able to teach in churches or any place else that you want to, to teach vegan or vegetarian classes. And that's how I did it. Um, the classes in Puerto Rico, I, I was trained over there and I was giving classes almost every month, but for two or three days, two or three days. And then when I moved to Puerto Rico now, that I started the classes over here, I, have a, I came here in year 2000, 2012, and I have given five classes already. And the next one comes. So what, um, what, in your opinion, are the benefits of a vegan diet? In my opinion, the, uh, the benefits of being vegan one thing I would say is for the animals, and the other thing is for my health. I mean, uh, you can be vegetarian, but it still is a lot of things that you're eating over there that are not too good, especially because the way that we buy or the, the one that we buy or whatever, we can be vegetarian and that's fine. Uh, but if you are vegan, then that gives you a lot better health that you can have. When you have your classes, um, generally speaking, what's the primary focus of your class? Okay, I just, the, my focus when I have my class in the living room back there is to let them know that the same way that when a lady has a baby or when you buy a car, you always get a manual for the car. So if something goes wrong, you can fix it. If the, when you go to the, have a baby, the doctor gives you a piece of paper and all the information that that child is supposed to be eating. So the same thing happened to us. When God created us, he gave us a manual, and that manual is the Bible. And that says that they know, because I have told them there where to find, what to eat, what not to eat, and what makes you healthy. And that's the principle. Um, all right, where do you find your recipes for your class? Or you want to take my job? I'm just curious. No. No, I have a, I have a, a good size a library in my house, and I have a lot of books. And every night, I can tell you, every night, when I'm going to sleep, I always have books by me of the uh, recipe book. Reading and checking and looking for new things or whatever. So I, and sometimes I go to the internet to verify some things I wanted to do. But most of the, uh, the recipe, I have it from, from my own books and my sisters. When they find something, we share right away. I have two sisters. Now there are commercially prepared fake meats, as I've always called them, um, like the Morningstar products. Do you use any of those in your cooking classes? Well, when I give the classes, I let them know that those products exist. But I teach them how to make the meat. So they have, said, and I let them know that whatever, when you make your meat, you know what ingredient is there. And when you make your own food, you know the ingredients over there. So that's how I do it. We do it, but they know that it's available. Do you advertise 
for your classes here in New Smyrna Beach, and how do you do that? Yes, we do advertise. Uh, uh, Lynn is the one that do all the advertisement, and there's a little book that uh, magazine something that she advertised over there. that's called Awakenings, and we put them over there. Um, Penny Saver. But after the first class, what I do is I have an email of everyone that took the classes and I send them notifications of the new classes and then some of them come, some of them cannot come, and but they always let me know if they're coming or not coming. All right, now there's got to be a lot of groceries involved in this, so who buys the groceries and where do the funds come from? The groceries. I'm the one that buys the groceries. I have four places that I go. I'm always looking the best for the less. Okay? So always checking everything else. And uh, at the end of the week or two weeks, then I fill out my information to the to the treasurer, there's Judy, and then she reimburses me a check for whatever I spend. But part of that that we use because it's the, it's the registration, when they register, they pay a certain amount of money, just a minimum, just so they can feel like they're paying for whatever they're taking. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you who does the cooking, but I'm going to ask you later to describe a class. But for right now, who does the cooking for your class? I do the cooking. Myself. All of it? All of it. Yes. I do. As, and they know because some of them help me sometimes and they see how hard it is. They, sometimes I do it at home, sometimes I do it over here. Most, I do it over here most of the time, but sometimes I do some things at home. Do you have helpers and how many helpers do you have? Oh, yes, I do have a lot of helpers. I have uh, I see Donald over here, he helped me, getting everything ready. I have um, Lynn, Lynn is the one that is always by me, I mean he's the one that helped me with the, when I get stuck, with the English, <laughs> and she is, if I need to cook something, and she's always checking on whatever I'm doing, and helping me, and cooking too, and And the other one is Edna, that is here, which I thank her a lot, because she's the one at the entrance over there, checking everybody. On an average, how many people attend your classes? Usually, a lot, uh, uh, we do not end with the same amount of people that registered. But it's, uh, we end up always up from about 15 and 20 people getting the certificate at the end of the eight weeks. Good. That's wonderful. All right, now um, I want you to describe a typical class. Yes. Okay. So we have slides for this one here. Okay, close attention. Yes, this is a typical class. This is this one was the second class. The first class for the second day of the class. And <laughs> it's, all I get is this sound. I'm pushing the left hand button and it's not doing it. how to substitute meat, how to substitute milk, 
how to substitute cheese, how to substitute eggs, uh, multiple types of sauces, a large variation of recipes, variations of soups, delicious desserts, dozens of helpful tips, the benefits of the use of herbs, benefits of being a vegetarian, types of vegetarian, how to plan your meals, and why vegetarian. They learn all of that when they take the class. Then I tell them whatever we're going to do during the week. I say that at that time, that section was for your health, for the animals, and for the planet. I, I show them the, the pyramid or the, for the, the vegetarian, and then the next one is for the vegan. Next. Now this is something that I teach them, why we don't eat the meat, okay? Uh, this little beetle over there is called carmine or cochineal. cochineal. Okay, this cochineal, the definition is for that is a food coloring derived from the dry bodies of female Beetles. Okay, next. What is carmine or cochineal? Where does carmine or cochineal come from? And why do vegans and vegetarians avoid it? The answer is carmine or cochineal is a red coloring that comes from the female cochineal beetle. The coloring comes from carminic acid in beetles who are killed, dried, and crushed to extract the acid. Carmine is used as a coloring in products such as candies, juice, drinks, and being the beautiful beauty products. It can be difficult to spot to spot in products as it sometimes is listed as a natural color. Examples of where it is being found. Yogurt, pudding, tapioca, grapefruit juice, strawberry shakes, snapple pink lemonade, soapy life water, citrus listerine, Starbucks strawberry cappuccino. I just let them know all those things so they know and they learn why we are vegan or vegetarian, why we don't eat certain food, that we have the right to choose what we want to eat and put it in our body. And so before, they used to put a name on the label that said cochineal, but nobody knew what was that. So they changed it to red number 40. So whatever you see that has a red number 40, that is the cochineal that they're using. Next. Those are some of the products that contain that. Keep going. Some of the products that contain the red color. Next. The gelatin is traditionally comes from cows, but now the source is often a skin pig or pig skin. Okay, next. The source of the gelatin, but not but now the source is often pig skin. And that, I don't know how to call that part of the pork, but it's coming from there. The big food? Ah, the big food. Okay. Next, please. This is very important too, because the production of the gelatin, the material that they use to make the gelatin is 20% bones, 28% bovine hides, and 24, 20, uh, 24 percent pig skin, and the production is in, in North America is 20 percent, Latin America 17 percent, and all the part of the world is 22 percent, and Western Europe is 39 percent. So we have it in the United States, and that's what we need. next, please. Just have some some of the the, the
products that contain that, the capsules that we take when we take capsules, and some of the products, but we're going to see the picture better. Next, please. See the Mentos, so those are some of the products. Mentos, M&M, Pot Stars, Jello, and the cheddar, the, remember the goldfish? They are